All right, so before the break, we were looking at um, how Ezekiel is being asked to give God's judgments to the people and make them listen. Uh, so in uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 7 to 9, this is what the Lord says to Ezekiel when he is commissioning him for his new ministry. So um, if someone could read out for us, Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Ezekiel 3, 7 to 9. But the house of Israel will not listen to you, because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are imprudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, and your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like adamant stone harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks though they are a rebellious house. All right. So here in these verses, God is giving him a warning and he says, these people are not going to listen to you easily. Because you see, they're they are depending on the words of the false prophets. They want to go back. They want to fight. Uh, so they will not listen to you easily. But this is what the Lord says in verse 8. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like this hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them. So these people are not going to quietly listening, listen to what you are going to tell them, you know, how they should quietly submit to the punishment and settle down in the land. They will not be willing to hear that. But don't worry, I will make you as hard and as tough as them. So even though there will be pressure from their side, you will be able to stay strong. You will be able to do your ministry and tell them all the words of judgment which I have you know, planned for them. Um, so um, we see that Ezekiel has been taken in that second batch along with a whole bunch of others. And they have all been placed in a place called Tel Aviv. They are somewhere near about 50 miles from the, from the main city of Babylon. That's basically where they are uh, settled. So it's supposed to be somewhere near the river Kaber. That's basically where the exiles have been placed. So when they are living over there, we don't know whether he was actually sitting next to the river when the visions happened or whether he was staying in his house when the visions happened. But uh, he, he starts off the book of Ezekiel by giving us a description of the vision which has come to him. Um, so if someone could read out for us um, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Um, Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoshian captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of Chaldeans by the river Cheber. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. It says, there the hand of the Lord was on him. So the Holy Spirit takes over and he begins to have a vision. And this is what he sees in the vision. He starts describing uh, some living creatures. He talks about how they have many wings and how there are uh, eyes inside their wings and all kinds of strange descriptions which are very difficult to understand. Um, but one thing we get to know that these living creatures are kind of supporting some kind of a vault is what it says over here. It's like a, these living creatures along with their wheels are supporting a kind of platform which is there on top. And on that platform is, is, where, is basically where you have the Lord seated. So it's something like a moving chariot or a moving throne or something of that type. Uh, maybe we can read out a few verses to kind of get a feel of what is being talked about. Um, so if someone could read out for us chapter 1, verses 19... 
yeah maybe you could just read verse 19 and then we we'll look at a few other verses verse 19 chapter when, 1 verse 19 when the living creatures went the wheels went beside them and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth the wheels were lifted up okay so these creatures are somehow attached in some way to those wheels so when the creatures move the wheels move and um verse 22 if you could read out the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. Yeah, so on top of these creatures, this is, is a kind of um, a vault is basically more like this shape rather than a flat platform. So it's maybe like a like a globe. I mean, I'm not sure. Um, exactly what he's trying to express but that thing is like a kind of a chariot and inside that or rather on that is basically where you have the lord seated or rather his glory is seen over there he himself can't be seen uh, completely properly but his glory can be seen um maybe we can look at verses 26 and 27 yeah if someone can read out verses 26 27 and above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone on the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it also from the appearance of his waist and a word i saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it and from the appearance of his waist and downward i saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around now look at the number of times she used the word likeness and the word appearance and as a so these are all ways of ezekiel trying to describe what he's seeing it's not saying that it looks like a rainbow he says it's like a rainbow he says the appearance is is like fire so he's talking about this throne uh, which looks like as if it is made of some kind of precious stones and on that is seated this person who looks like the appearance of a man but not exactly like a human being and then uh, he, he tries to describe the appearance of the Lord and he says waist upward look he looks like glowing metal and waist downward it's like as if it's it's burning fire so um, this is his way of trying to use human words to describe something which cannot be described in human words. So the Lord, you know, whom we interact with in such a casual manner, we go to him whenever we want to pray. Uh, we, when we're angry, you know, we say uh, things which we should not say to the Lord. We take him so casually, we forget who he is. I mean, um, this is just one small vision that Ezekiel is having of this almighty God. And he's finding it so difficult to put one sentence also which makes sense to describe this almighty God. Uh, so he tries to adjust by talking about the living creatures. He gives us most description of the living creatures. He doesn't know what to say about the one who was seated on the throne above the living creatures. That is the kind of God that we worship. So, uh, you know, we need to have a little reverence and awe when we are approaching him and in the way we live in his presence. So a God like that was willing to lower himself to a level where he's now living within us and he's willing to accept us as his temple. I mean, what an honor, what a privilege. So I think we should treat him with respect. So if he has chosen someone like him and this man Ezekiel is not able to even describe the, the throne that he's sitting on, that God is choosing to consider us as his temple and is willing to live inside us. I mean, how low he has come, how much he has reduced himself to put up with a temple like this. So we should be very honorable in the way we treat our bodies, in the way we conduct ourselves, in the choices that we make, because this is a very great and awesome God who humbled himself for no reason. I mean, he doesn't need to humble himself for anyone, but he chose to do that out of his love for us. So, you know, this is just something that comes across when we are reading all these descriptions which are given in the book of Ezekiel. So this awesome almighty God, he seems to be moving somewhere because you see, you have these wheels. These wheels are 
are are moving and then the wheels start rising up into the air so it's like as if god is getting ready to go somewhere so where is he going we don't uh, we are not told that in chapter 1 we only get to know about that later so um in chapter 2 and chapter 3 he talks about what this this person who is in the likeness of a human who is seated on the throne he begins to talk to ezekiel and this is what the lord says uh, so in chapter 2 and chapter 3 he basically ezekiel talks about what the lord said to him what he asked him to do and all of that uh, so this is what the lord is saying to him in ezekiel chapter 2 um verses 7 to 9 if you could read out um no 7 to 10 ezekiel chapter 2 verses 7 to 10 if someone could read out please and those salt salt to speak my words unto them whether they will hear or whether they will forbear for they are most rebellious but those son of man hear what i say unto thee but be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house open thy mouth and eat that i give thee and when i look behold an hand was sent unto me and lo a roll of a book was terrain and he and and he spirit it before me and it was written within and without and there was written therein lamentation and mourning and woe all right so the lord is saying you know i'm going to send you out as my prophet these people are not going to be willing to listen to you but don't worry i'll make you hard and tough so you will be able to talk to them you will be able to deal with them and this is what the lord says to him in uh, in uh, chapter 2 verse 8 he says son of man listen to what i say to you do not rebel like that rebellious people open your mouth and eat what i give you so the he, in the vision he is given a scroll to eat and is it a scroll with very nice things written on it no it's a scroll on, on which you have words of lament and mourning and woe and judgment it's that kind of a scroll so god is saying don't be like these people who are always rejecting my word instead you be willing you open your mouth and you eat what i'm giving you so he eats it what do you think how do you think a, a scroll like this will taste will it taste nice and sweet like ice cream or will it taste like bitter gourd how do you think this scroll would taste and this is what ezekiel says in ezekiel chapter 3 verse 3 you someone can read out ezekiel 3 3 and he said to me son of man feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that i give you so i ate and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness yeah so uh, the lord says to him eat the scroll i am giving you and fill your stomach with it so i ate it and he says it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth a scroll filled with judgment and lamentation and woe is tasting sweet the lesson that is being brought across to us over here is that though the disciplining of the lord will be painful it is actually sweet it is meant for our good so here god is speaking words of judgment and correction against them but the lord is not speaking these words to them just to condemn them or to crush them he is speaking these words to them so that they will be willing to submit they will be willing to repent and if they do that the result will be sweet it will not be bitter yes it's painful in the beginning when you are undergoing the correction but if you submit willingly and accept the correction the lord is giving the end result is that it will be sweet inside your stomach so the lord says fill your stomach with my words so you know we can literally maybe take that you know in in our um, uh, for us new testament believers you know when we are reading his word and we are supposed to be practicing it it's like as if we are supposed to eat it and fill our stomach with it you know not take one little bit from here and there because you know oh lord your word is so painful your requirements oh lord are so high oh lord i don't want to listen to you so very reluctantly we we take one little bit from here one little bit from there but here what does it say the lord is saying fill your stomach with it and when he was willing to do that he he says it was sweet it tasted sweet like honey so basically you know maybe uh, you can you know it reminds us of hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 where it says um 
yeah hebrews 12 11 it says no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful later on however it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it training is painful so when the lord is training you correcting you telling you to get rid of this and that and uh, you know he's asking you to make sacrifices training is painful it's not pleasant like it very openly says over here nothing pleasant about it but later on it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace so at that time his words will taste sweet like honey you know to us so uh, here uh, ezekiel submits to the lord he chooses to uh, to become a prophet he chooses to minister to the lord and uh, so he begins god starts giving him words of prophecy and then in chapter 11 we get to know uh, where this chariot is going so in chapter 1 we started off by describing the chariot and the chariot is about to go somewhere and in chapter 11 we get to know where it is going so now in chapter 11 ezekiel is brought to the east gate of the jerusalem temple now the temple had many many gates because it was this large piece of land in the middle of course you had the actual temple but all around it you have the temple complex where you have rooms where the priests will stay you have storage rooms where the grain is stored you have uh, uh, some rooms where all the you know gold vessels and all are uh, kept you have certain rooms where the guards will be staying you have all these other extra so it's a, it's, a, it's a large temple complex and there are many many gates uh, leading to it so right now over here ezekiel is brought to the east gate of the temple and over there in the vision because physically where is he physically he is actually in babylon he is somewhere near the kebar river but in the vision he is brought over here to the east gate of the temple and there he sees 25 leaders and what are these 25 leaders doing in the vision? They're giving false prophecies. And they're encouraging the people to you know to rebel against what God is telling them. And uh, so God says in the vision, start prophesying against them. And even as Ezekiel begins to prophesy against them, one of them falls down dead right then and there. So he sees all this happening in the vision. So in chapter 11, Ezekiel is very, very distressed. He says, Lord, are you, are you going to start killing everyone? Will nobody be left? And then the Lord speaks assurance to him and says, don't worry, judgment must happen. But after that, there will be restoration. And then in chapter 11 itself, verses 19 and 20, he talks about how one day he's going to take out the heart of stone, which is there in the people. He'll give them a soft heart of flesh and they will be able to obey the lord they will submit to the lord so there will be a remnant which will you know grow once again so god gives them gives all these words of assurance and after having spoken these words of hope the chariot rises up it leaves the temple and goes away it's uh it, it very clearly says that um this would be in, at the end of, uh, yeah, maybe someone can actually read out this. Um, chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. Chapter 11, 22 and 23. So the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the east city. So basically, you have the glory of the Lord leaving. What did the uh, for, what are the false prophets saying? Oh, God will defend His temple; nothing bad will happen to the city. But here in the vision, Ezekiel actually sees the glory of God leaving the temple, leaving the city, and going and waiting outside the city because now judgment is going to happen. The third attack of Nebuchadnezzar is going to take place, and the punishment will be completed. Nothing is going to stop it. And so uh, Ezekiel, you know, he comes out of the vision. He starts sharing these details with all the exiles over there. Most probably the exiles did not listen to what he is saying. Maybe they still continue to, you know, uh, talk about rebellion and all of that. So now God gives one more sign. Okay, after this vision, I think the vision should have been enough. They, they should have been shocked enough to accept what God is saying, but they don't. And now there is one more sign given to these people. 
and this will be in Ezekiel chapter 24, where the Lord says, I'm going to do something very terrible. Your wife is going to die. So he tells in, uh, in chapter 24, verse 16, he says, with one blow, I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. So Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel, I'm going to, uh, you know, allow your wife to die. And this is going to be like an object lesson. Because when she dies, um, when, when, when someone dies, you know, you have an entire set of funeral procedures. You do many, many various ceremonies to honor them to show them that they were loved and they were valued. And so, you know, you have a list of ceremonies which you do, including lamenting for them and all of that. Um, so here in chapter 24, uh, the Lord says to Ezekiel, when she dies, the delight of your eyes when she dies, don't mourn her. In your heart, grieve for her, feel the pain. But outwardly, the Lord says, you know, don't, uh, uh, don't cover your mustache, uh, you know, um, don't trim your hair. He gives him a list of things that he should not do because these are all the funeral procedures which they did. And so the Lord says, you will not do that. Um, maybe you can, we can just read out one verse. Um, chapter 24, verse 17. Chapter 24, verse 17. Sigh in silence, make no mourning for the hair. Your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat men's bread of sorrow. So the Lord says, don't do any of these things. And so Ezekiel goes and tells the people, this is what God is going to be doing. So it's, he says in verse 18, so I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening, my wife died. And so the next day they're expecting all the funeral procedures to start. But he doesn't do any of those things. And the people are shocked. Because you see, this lady was the delight of his eyes, someone that he loved deeply, but he's not doing any of the mourning procedures. So they come to him and they ask, why are you not doing it? What is the meaning of this? And then he says, the delight of your eyes, Jerusalem, it will fall. But on that day, in the same way, I am not mourning for my wife today. You must not mourn for Jerusalem on that day because this, is, this judgment is coming directly from the Lord and you must accept it. So on that day, do not mourn, rather submit and say, yes, Lord, we have sinned. And because of that, you have rightfully, justly done this to us and accept your fate. So I think maybe at least after this, maybe the people began to listen to him because this is a very painful and shocking sign which is being given to them. And shortly after this, Nebuchadnezzar comes and makes his final attack. All right, so um, um, that is the book of, Ezekiel. So, you know, if anyone here is thinking, oh, my life is tough, my ministry is tough, the people of those days, those prophets, their ministry was much tougher. The demands that the Lord laid on them were much greater. You know, so, but they were so faithful and they did not turn against the Lord. So, great is their reward. I mean, I don't know how great the reward will be, but it will be something amazing because of the level of obedience and submission which those people, you know, those prophets showed in those times. Um, so we should aspire to be uh, like that in our own Christian walk. So coming very quickly to the book of Daniel. So Daniel, as we, you know, we saw earlier, he was not taken during the second... Um, you know, second attack of Nebuchadnezzar, he was taken in the first attack itself. So um, that was uh, that was the time when many of the aristocratic royal family members were taken away, including Daniel and his uh, friends. Uh, so we we get to know that um, you know based on the date, the dates which are given and the timing and all of that. We, we, we get to know that Daniel was probably around 16 or 17 years of age when he was taken. So, you know, we, we generally think of Daniel as a grown-up man going over there. But actually, it's just a youngster. I mean, in our modern day, he would be like in 11th standard, 12th standard, maybe at the most first year degree. A very young guy, not some, some you know, uh, confident, established grown-up man. So you have this bunch of kids 
I mean, I mean, at least in my eyes, because I'm old, you know, they're like literally kids, 16, 17 year old guys. They go over there and because, you know, they are very brilliant, the Babylonians decide that they will use them in their royal palace. So they start training them and they start giving them this food, uh, which is forbidden according to the law of Moses. And these young guys, they stand up to those officials and they say, no, we will not have it. I mean, what guts it takes. These are not grown up men who are, who are you know, resisting and protesting. These are just youngsters, young boys. But they love the Lord. And they take a stand and say, it's all right. You see, actually, they're being promised a better quality of life. They've all been taken as exiles. But these people are being given special status. They're going to be trained to become part of the uh, what um, civil services. You know, like I mean, in, in our country, civil services is a big thing. A lot of people write exam to go for that. These people have been chosen for that, for the higher level of administrative roles in the in the in the palace. So this is a very high positions that are being offered to them free. You know, training is free. I mean, they're not, they don't, they're not going to be charged for it. All they have to do is eat what is being given to them. But Daniel and his friends say, no, according to the law of Moses, there are certain foods that we should not touch and we will not have it. So they have, for them, even at that young age, honoring the Lord was more important and getting benefits than you know uh, get, uh, living in peace for them they didn't mind even resisting the officials if it meant you know having to dishonor the lord in some way they would rather be uh, you know uh, dishonor these leaders rather than dishonor the lord for them that was the stand which they took at a young age so therefore i think the lord would have used them powerfully um, you know in, in in each of their lives not just daniel but even his friends so coming to the book of Daniel, uh, we see that the first chapter is written in the Hebrew language, where an introduction is given, how they were taken over there. Um, but chapter 2 onwards, up to chapter 7, is written in the Aramaic language, because that was the language which was being spoken in those areas at that time. So Daniel wanted even the people of that of those places to understand what is being told in chapters 2 to 7. Because in chapters 2 to 7, you have a lot of details being given about the visions, uh, the, the dreams which Nebuchadnezzar is having, and the dream of Belshazzar. And okay, Belshazzar doesn't have a dream, he has a vision. So, you know, all those details are given in chapters 2 to 7. And Daniel wanted even those people also to know all the things which happened. So chapters 2 to 7 are recorded in the Aramaic language. And then chapter 8 onwards up to chapter 12, it's, it's just talking about what will happen to the Jewish nation. So that's written again in the normal Hebrew language. So there's something special about these chapters 2 to 7. It was so, uh, God considered it so important that he asked that Daniel should write it in the Aramaic language rather than in the Hebrew language language. So what exactly happens in these chapters? Why are these chapters so important? Um, if you were to see uh, chapters, chapter 2 will basically talk about, uh, you know, this dream which Nebuchadnezzar has is about a big statue. Um, the top part is represents Babylon. And then you have other, you know, the statues made up of different, different parts. Uh, and they all represent different kingdoms. Uh, so uh, Nebuchadnezzar is not able to understand the meaning of the dream. And then da uh, the Lord helps Daniel to give him the interpretation. And then um, in chapters 4 and 5, uh, you again have um, a dream which Nebuchadnezzar has. has and uh, the vision of uh, Belshazzar is given, his son Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son Belshazzar, that is given in chapter 5. So in all of these chapters, basically the, the Lord is telling, the living God, Yahweh, is telling, right now you people are in power, but you know what? A time will come when God will wipe you out. So don't think that you are all powerful. Because Nebuchadnezzar thought, thought, thought himself such a great person that he made a large statue of himself and he wanted everyone to worship it, like as if he is a god. That was the level of pride 
which Nebuchadnezzar had. And uh, so that is why we see in chapter 3, you know, he asks every, everyone to worship that uh, statue. And then uh, Daniel and his friends, they refuse to do that. They are thrown into the furnace, but God preserves their life and they come out alive. Uh, so all of that happens. And in chapter 4, God again sends a warning to Nebuchadnezzar and tells him, if you refuse to submit to me and accept me as the living God, and if you, you know, continue to ask people to worship you, I'll, I'll reduce, it to, reduce you to such a low level that you'll become like an animal in the field. I mean, you who consider yourself so powerful and so wise and so great, I can in an instant reduce you to, reduce you to nothing because it's me who has helped you to win all these wars and become who you have become. But you, in your mind, you're thinking that you are so great and you're like a god, but you are nothing. And so in ch chapter 4, we see that Nebuchadnezzar, for a certain number of, uh, I think, a year or something, for a, for, for a period of one year, or was it more than that? I don't really remember. Um, so he becomes like an animal. You know, he loses his mind, becomes like a mad person. Uh, so God does that to him. And then in the next chapter, you have a vision being given to Belshazzar, who is also very proud and also wants to be, you know, declared as a as a as a great uh, some uh, as a great personality to be honored and worshipped. And God says to him, you know, uh, the very next day you will be assassinated. I'm so sorry. Was it for a long time or was it just now? Did it, did it get muted a long time ago? And anyway, I hope I'm audible now. Two minutes. I'm so sorry. I mean, you see, it does that on its own without anyone touching the laptop. So I didn't even know it had happened. I'm very sorry. The next time, uh, you know, uh, if someone could just immediately warn me, uh, because no one was touching the thing, it happened on its own. So yeah. So in chapter 6, you have um, yeah, Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. Um, so all these things show the, the pride of the kings and what God does to these boastful kings. So in a way, these chapters, they point towards um, Genesis chapter 1. Because in Genesis chapter 1, human beings are created in the image of God to rule and reign and to have dominion. So they are supposed to rule over the beasts of the earth. And, the, and humans are supposed to be their rulers. But if these rulers become proud, and if they go against the living God who has given them this stature, who has given them this special status, if they go against him, the Lord shows, I can reduce it to the level of the beasts. So you see, that's the lesson which comes out from, from uh, this particular portion. So chapters 2 to 7 are uh, written in the Aramaic language. And then uh, chapter 8 onwards, you have different details being given uh, about the, um, you know. So in chapter 7, you have um, a dream in which Daniel sees four beasts. And then in the end, you have one very large beast rising up. And God finally comes and judges it. And it is destroyed. Uh, so um, in chapter 8, you have an explanation given about two of those beasts and what it means. Um, and in chapters 10 to 12, it gives some details about the end times um, and how the king of the north 
will be destroyed. We don't know whether that king of the north is referring to Antichrist or whether it's referring to some Old Testament time king. Uh, we don't really know the details. Um, chapter 9, on the other hand, is Daniel's prayer where he fasts and prays and says, Lord, the 70 years of exile is now almost coming to an end. So you can imagine he went over there as a teenager. Okay, so when Daniel first went, he was a teenager. Now uh, it's been 70 years. So he must have died at a very old age. You know? So Daniel lived for many, many, many years. Uh, like it says, right? Those who honor the Lord and follow his ways, they will have a long and blessed life. Uh, so um, Daniel actually has that. Um, so, um, um, so in chapter 8, you have an explanation given about two of the beasts which are mentioned in chapter 7. Again, in chapters 10 to 12, some more details are given. And so some people say that this king of the north who is destroyed in chapter uh, the, uh, in chapters 10 to 12, uh, where it talks about the king of the north, some people say it is actually talking about the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes, who comes in the 160s BC. He is the man who comes and desecrates the temple. He puts a he sacrifices a pig in the temple because the Old Testament says that you, you know the Israelites should not eat a pig. So he actually slaughters a pig over there in the temple just to dishonor the God of Israel. He does all those things. So they say that most probably, uh, you know, the king of the north who is mentioned in chapters 10 to 12 refers to this person. And then there are other people who say, no, 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 it must be talking about the Antichrist who will come in the end times. So there's difference of opinion regarding that. Um, but, you know, just for us to briefly go back to chapter 7, where he has the original dream about these beasts and all of that. Um, in Daniel chapter 7, so you have four different beasts which rise up. And in the end, you have one large evil beast with many horns. Um, um, and each of the horns represents different kings who are going to come to power uh, and all of those details. In chapter 7 verse 9 is where it starts talking about how God will judge this final beast and you know destroy it so maybe we can read out daniel chapter 7 verses 9 to 11 um because you know all those details about uh, which king will rise up and which kingdom will fall i mean those are just things which you can read for yourself um but maybe we can just focus on this portion where god's judgment is released upon the uh, final beast in the end so daniel 7 9 to 11, if someone could read out. I watched till, till thrones were put in place, and the ensign of days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure bull. His throne was a fairy flame, its wheel a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and, issued and came for forth from before him. A thousand, thousand ministered to him. Then thousand times ten, ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the book were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Okay, so the last portion, I mean, so this Daniel chapter 7 is talking about the end times, the last portion of history. Uh, when this final beast and the final horn which rises up from the beast, uh, the beast is compared, they say it's probably a nation, the final nation which will rise up, which is which will be all powerful. And from that uh, nation, one horn will come out, that is one king will rise up as the most powerful. And uh, so it's talking about those end times and it talks about how the ancient of days will come and judge and the beast will be slain, the horn, you know, which will be crushed. Uh, so all the evil will be finally destroyed. So at that time, when the end times, when the, when the, when the king of kings and lord of lords, who is, you know, described over here as ancient of days, when he is seated on the throne, this is what it says. It says uh, in verse 10, 
the court was seated and the books were opened so there will be a set of books which will be opened at that time what do these books refer to it's obviously not the book of life because book of life is only one book here it's talking about plural it's talking about the books which were opened so this is all theory because nobody really knows no one has gone over there to heaven and come back and told us the details so we don't really know but generally this is what is told there will be books in which all the things which we are doing the choices we make all that will be recorded you know because we are reward in heaven the bill for believers the reward in heaven will be based on what we have done for the lord so reward is that book of life on the other hand is salvation i mean so that you don't earn it it's freely given so anyone who believes in the lord jesus their names will be written down in the book of life so the books which are referred to over here they say is probably referring to the books in which all the things which we have done said our choices which we made when we honored him when we did not honor him when we exercised our faith when we failed to exercise our faith all those things are written down in the books so every human beings deeds are recorded in the books and um, so that is probably what is referred to over here in daniel chapter 7 verse 10 is what they say uh, because if you see in revelation chapter 20 verse 12 if someone can read out revelation 20 verse 12 and i saw the dead is small and great standing before god and books were open and other book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books all right so here the dead that is those who have not placed their faith in the lord jesus you know they are like spiritually dead uh, set for judgment these people are going to be judged according to what they have done as is recorded in the books but there is also an another book which is mentioned which is what it says over there in verse um, you know in in verse um, 12 another book was opened which is the book of life so it looks like there's going to be something called the book of life where the name of every person who has placed their faith in the lord jesus will be written down in that book of life and those people are not called dead they are the ones who have re received eternal life they will live with the lord forever their names are in the book of life but you have another set of books according to which deeds of the people are uh, judged so it that's it, it says the same thing again in verse 15 revelation 20 verse 15 anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the uh, lake of uh, fire um so the book of life when was it written uh, revelation 13 verse 8 where it says all whose names have not been written in the lamb's book of life the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world and then revelation 17 8 where it says the inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world so even before the world was created god had already made a salvation plan and god already knew who are all the people who will place their faith in the lord jesus so our names were already entered into the book of life at that time because god knew who will accept jesus and who will not accept jesus so our names are written in the book of life but then there are other books in which the deeds of people are mentioned and these dead the ones who are spiritually dead they will their judgment will be declared based on those books so people like hitler and people who have been extremely evil they will receive greater levels of punishment on the other hand uh, the people who have not indulged in very terrible sins they will be given lesser levels of punishment so um so these are all the things you know which um, are referred to so daniel chapter 12 the last chapter it also talks about the resurrection that will be daniel chapter 12 verses 1 to 4 um 
maybe we can um, read out verses 1 2 and 3 yeah daniel 12 uh, verses 1 2 and 3 at that time michael shall stand up the great prince who is stand watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life some to shame and everlasting contempt those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever okay so here it's talking about that end time judgment and the resurrection is how you know that the it says over there both the unrighteous and the righteous will both be resurrected so you see some the the people who have eternal life they will be resurrected unto it for everlasting life uh, verse 2 multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life others to shame and everlasting contempt so those who have accepted the lord those whose names are there in the book of life they will be resurrected for eternal life the unrighteous will also be resurrected physically but they will be resurrected to live in the uh, lake of fire so um, judgment will come up uh, resurrection will happen to both but judgment will come and it says in uh, verse 3 those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens that is the way the righteous will shine on that day and those who have led many to righteousness you know those who shared the gospel those who took the effort to go and tell people about jesus how will they shine like the stars forever and ever so these are the kind of goals that we should be aiming for uh, you know so that uh, the lord will be pleased with what we have done and he you know we will receive our reward on that day um so yeah th just these are just some of the things that we could touch upon from these three major prophetic books uh, so there are no questions here in the chat any questions at all in the class otherwise we can close ah, some students are completely confident no doubts he's shaking his head fully no doubt at all all right yeah let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for these scriptures which reveal to us who you are lord we see you in your awesome majesty all powerful uh, where even the living creatures can't look at you directly. I mean, you are that majestic, that awesome. And Lord, we see your great compassion, a God who is so high and so great, chooses to be so loving and so patient with people who are rebelling against him. What an awesome God you are, O oh Lord. Um, thank you, O oh Lord, for your love and for your mercy and your compassion and your kindness. Like, we saw in the book of Lamentations, Lord, even when you're disciplining your people, you do it in love so that uh, they may not, so that they may be re restored one day and rather than being destroyed. Because, so oh Lord, we read in Lamentations that you don't inflict grief upon anyone um, willingly. It is only punishment which you bring upon people when they have sinned against you. So we thank you, O oh Lord, for your love, for your compassion. And Lord, we pray that we would be like this Ezekiel and like this Daniel, O oh Lord, who chose to honor you, even though they had to face opposition, even though they had to undergo uh, uh, difficult things, persecution, they were willing to stand up, O oh Lord, because honoring you mattered to them more than achieving something in the world. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to be like them. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we will have the joy of shining like stars because we took the effort to lead people to righteousness, to tell people about you and share about you. So we pray, O oh Lord, that even as we commit ourselves into your hands, you would do these things in our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.